Thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon for Building on What's Good, A New Way to Fight Poverty. This afternoon we welcome Jose Quinones as a speaker for Talks at Google. Um, I'm proud to say Jose is a personal friend of mine and has uh, recently won what's called the MacArthur Award. Welcome, Jose. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for, for uh, making time to come and, and, and be a part of the, the, the talks. I mean, it really is a pleasure to be here. Uh, very excited to kind of get the invitation to kind of, you know, kind of share with you some of our, our learnings in, in our work to uh, end poverty. Um, you, know, you know, before I start in kind of getting into our actual work, you know, I, I did want to sort of share some, you know, some of my story and then some of, you know, even kind of addressing some of the, uh, you know, the political climate of the day because it actually, it all impacts, you know, a lot of the work that we do. Uh, you know, I'm an immigrant. You know, I came to this country when I was nine years old back in 1980, along with my five siblings. You know, the oldest uh, at that time was 15 and the youngest kid was, uh, was seven. I'm the second to the youngest. And, uh, you know, I do remember, you know, crossing the, the U.S.-Mexico border in the dark of night. And it was actually on July 4th of 1980 when we actually crossed, uh, you know, at, at night. We were, you know, shepherded through the border uh, into Tijuana. And, and I remember actually feeling very, um, very afraid as a kid, not knowing what the future, you know, had store for us. I mean, I had no idea, well, you know, really well, why we were, were making that happen. But, but, uh, but, but that happened. That happened to me in my life and in my family's life. And... Eventually, after crossing, we actually made our way all the way to San Jose, and that's where we had extended family uh, that, that we were able to, to live with, you know, and, uh, and for the first couple of years of living with them, and I remember being told, you know, repeatedly, you know, to not, not talk about our situation with anybody. You know, I, I think I started in fourth grade, and they even told us to not tell our teachers, don't say anybody, don't tell anybody what, we're, you know, what is happening with, with our family. And, uh, and, 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 you know, so we learned to kind of be quiet, to kind of, you know, kind of live in the shadows and, and, and not make, and not, not be vis visible, you know, in, in society at all. Uh, but, you know, for, but luckily, um, you know, in 1986, uh, President Reagan at the time actually signed a bill that actually gave immigrants like, like my family, myself and my family, amnesty. Uh, the bill in 1986 said that anybody that came to this country before 1982 you know, were granted, you know, amnesty, basically. So we had to apply, and then we were given, you know, uh, a temporary status for a couple of years. And after, the, after that temporary status, we got a green card. And after the green card, you know, we were eligible to become citizens. And so, so in, in 86, really, my, you know, the, uh, I remember feeling, you know, a, um, uh, you know, the shadow, you know, kind of lifting from our lives, you know, and, and, and for us, you know, really kind of unshackling us so that we can actually live the full, our full lives to the fullest, right? Uh, you know, and so, so that was really uh, important because without that, you know, I don't think, you know, I, I would have been able to do anything, you know, in my professional life, and I don't think I would have been able to, you know, stand here before you and talking to you about my story and what we've done with, you know, with the Mission Asset Fund. Uh, you know, and I think, you know, this is a type of story that I'm sure many of you as immigrants can probably tell that yourselves, or, and I'm sure many of us have heard Stories like that where, you know, a nine-year-old boy or a five-year-old kid can come to this country and, you know, work hard and, you know, and avail themselves of a lot of opportunities that we have in our country and make something of themselves to the point that, you know, professionally they can get to the point of actually, you know, getting awarded the MacArthur Fellowship, which, which is one of the, the, the highest uh, honors in, in our professional life. You know, and that is pretty typical, right? And I don't really think that that's a very unique story, but it is my story. And it's a story that I think now more important than ever that it needs to be said. You know, now is more important than ever for us to actually share those stories, you know, because in my mind, it is those stories that actually, they really do signify, you know, why, what, you know, what, what really does make America great. And it is about allowing people to really, truly uh, develop their full, you know, human and economic potential and then give back into society likewise. So I, I was very fortunate at the, you know, uh, for having... Uh, haven't been able to, to do that, but, but again, I want to sort of share the story, start with a story, because, you know, in, 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 uh, nowadays, as you know, in the past two weeks, you know, under the new uh, current administration, all that, that you know, that, that we hold true and dear in what we believe America to be is actually being under attack. 
you know, and, and I'm, I'm concerned, not just for myself, but for my family and the, and the communities that we work with. And so, so this is the time to actually, uh, I think that we need to, again, to speak out more, more than ever. Um, so having said that, I, want, I do want to sort of tell you more or less about what it is that we do at the Mission as a Fund and why it was that, you know, we were uh, awarded a MacArthur uh, a Fellowship. Uh, the MacArthur Fellowship, just to clarify, is not something that you apply for. It's something that actually they just called and said, you, you get this thing. You know, you don't apply. You don't, you don't, can't even, you know, refer somebody else to apply. It's sort of like they sort of select you for the creativity that, the, the, you know, that and also the trajectory of your work. So you know, it was a pretty big honor. But I want to sort of kind of give you a sense of why that is and, and why that happened you know, by giving you uh, more insights into our work. And, and, and really also want, you know, if you take away anything from, from this conversation, I, you know, uh, I want you to sort of think about this is that you know, really the underpinning of our work is to work with low-income uh, individuals to try to develop the full financial uh, potential and, and really addressing the issues of poverty. And so what we've learned in that work is just this, is that poverty is hard. It's hard to solve. It's really difficult, actually. It's actually very complicated. It's a very complicated issue. And, uh, and I know that for a fact that in the way that we've been addressing you know, the issue in the past, we're not really doing, you know, I, I, we're not really advancing the issue much. And so, so what we've learned is that we need to innovate. We need to uh, create new programs, new ideas, test them out. And, uh, and really trying to find out what exactly is, you know, uh, what, what exactly works you know, in people's lives. And I think you know, our work at the Mission Asa Fund with Lending Circles primarily has become that example in, in, our, in our national dialogue on how to combat, uh, you know, how to combat poverty. So I want to definitely uh, you know, talk to you more about that. But before that, I wanted to you know, show you a video because we actually have you know, a deep relationship with Google. Back in 2004, there was a Bay Area 2014, sorry, I skipped a decade there. Uh, 2014, uh, uh, Google had a, uh, you know, m m make the Bay Area better, better, better? Build a better Bay Area. Build a better Bay Area. And, uh, and I think that was the thing that was like over 2,000 people. Uh, that was uh, 2,000, uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, people applied, organizations, uh, to so get, get support for their work. And we were fortunate to actually be one of the top 10 organizations and because of that Google actually produced this video and so I want to stop there and kind of make you watch it for for just a minute okay My name is Jose Quiñones I'm the CEO of the Mission Asset Fund in the Bay Area, there are thousands of families, hardworking families that are in the financial shadows, people that are invisible to the credit system, uh, people that are stuck with high cost predatory products, and people that are really strapped and have a hard time making ends meet. Our goal is to engage thousands of families and help them build their financial capability by having access to checking accounts, by being able to improve their credit scores, create lending circles, and being able to even pay down their high cost debt. And those are the people that we actually need to help uh, empower with access to the right tools so that we can help them fulfill their full economic potential. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so that was, uh, again, a video that was produced by, you know, in that competition. And, uh, and, and we had a, you know, when that came out, you know, we, we did a whole campaign to kind of get people to actually vote for us. So, so it was a lot of fun, a lot of work, but it was definitely a lot of fun to, uh, to engage in. And we, you know, still use a video to sort of, one, introduce, you know, the nature of our work, why we do our work, and, and uh, you know, really kind of just to show some fabulous shots of, of folks living in the mission. So you know, so we started our work back in 2007 uh, in, in the Mission District, working with you know, again low-income uh, immigrants to try to build and develop their financial capability. Uh, the, for us, the question was: Well, we know, soon enough we found out that you know that, that our target market, our target clients, actually you know, by and large they were actually were they considered unbanked meaning that they didn't have a checking account or a savings account. I think like over 50% of adults, uh, immigrant adults in, in, in the neighborhood just didn't have a checking account. 
And then we also learned soon enough that about 44% of uh, admission households, this is again back in 2005 when a study was, was made, uh, that 44% of admission households did not have a credit score or credit history. And so, so when, we, when we were doing our work, it's like, well, how do you actually help uh, people develop their financial capability when, in fact, they didn't have access to the most basic tools in to actually build their financial lives? Not No checking accounts, no savings accounts, and no, even no credit score, credit history. Um, and so, so, so we trust, you know, so that was the, the, you know, the barriers that we're trying to address. But soon enough, too, we also realized that that problem was not just uh, people living in the Mission District. You know, the, those problems of being, uh, you know, being in the financial shadows, you know, really re re resonate people all over, all over the country. Uh, you know, to the point where, um, you know, recently there was a study by the Federal Reserve, and it's called the Report on the Economic Well-Being of U.S. Households in 2015, that they found that uh, a lot of people, you know, this is 22% oh, of employed adults, they found that 22% of employed adults have multiple jobs, and they actually have multiple informal jobs. So these are people that are working in the, in the gig economy, the Uber drivers. These are people that are working in the flea market. These are people that are babysitting very informally to try to make ends meet. So imagine like one out of every five you know, working adults uh, you know, have to contend with managing their finances by, you know, by, by working in informal settings where their incomes can go up and down depending on the day, depending on the week, depending on the month. Unlike us, right? We know exactly how much we're going to be getting paid on a month-to-month -month basis, on a year-to-year -year basis. We have this, you know, sort of stability of income, but that's something that is not the case for a lot of people, you know, in, in our world. And um, and so, so that that actually presents a challenge, you know, because the, this the financial instability that comes with not being able to, you know, uh, uh, predict how much you'll be making that day or that month, that week or that month. You know, it, it, people you know, uh, find a lot of challenges of, of of actually managing their budgets to the point where the, the, the same report found that about a third of the people that said that they work in this type of in, you know, informal employment, a third of them actually say that they struggle to actually pay you know, their bills. You know, because not, not, they don't just experience income, what is called income volatility, but they also experience you know, a, a lot of volatility in their expenses. And so it actually gets harder to manage their finances you know, when they don't know exactly how much they're gonna get or even how much they're actually gonna be paying out. And so it's, so it's harder, right? It's harder to uh, manage your life like that. And, uh, and then we also found, I mean, again, doing more research about you know, the, the nature of poverty in our world is that, you know, that a lot of in, uh, individuals actually find themselves stuck where they're at, where you know, they they're actually do not see themselves living out what we call, call the American dream anymore. You know, the, the American dream, you know, defining it as like, you know, your kid will do better than you, or your, your offspring will, be, will do better than the prior generation. Where in fact, you know, uh, back in the 1940s, the people that were born in the 40s, you know, they earned more money than their parents. 90% of people that, voted and that were born in the 40s, that makes sense? 90% of people that were born in the 1940s made more money than their parents. People that were born in 1980s, about 50% of them can actually say that. So just in that measure alone, we can actually can see how, uh, you know, how a lot of people are just not even being able to realize this idea, the idea of the American dream. And so they really are stuck in, 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 uh, you know, in, in where they're at. And, uh, and again, you know, in, in this idea of, um, uh, of not being able to, to earn enough money you know, or, or even uh, improve economically in that sense, you know, it really bears out when you think about the discrepancies of how we as, a, as an economy has improved, you know, the, the, the level of productivity. And again, this is a, you know, very highly cited number where, where since 19, I think in the past three decades, I think in, starting in the middle uh, 1970s, the, the level of productivity has increased, you know, significantly, you know, from year to year to the point that increased by 73%. But you know, in the same time period, the, the level of hourly pay for workers that are actually doing the work, you know, their, their pay only increased by 11%. So there's this growing gap you know, the, of, of, the, of how we're, as an economy, increasing our productivity, but the people that are actually working on, a, on an hourly basis, they're not, they're not benefiting from that level of productivity. So, so people are feeling strained. If people are feeling, again, uh, like they can't make ends meet, and, and they know that they're not living out you know, to the ideals of, of improving their livelihoods you know, based on this idea of, of the American dream. So, 
So people are struggling, you know, and, and again, this is another statistic, just to kind of bear that a little bit more, is that one in five Americans have no credit or checking account. So this is not just an issue, again, of folks in our, in our community in the Mission District, but this is actually happening across the country. And so, and without access to those basic products or services, it just makes it virtually impossible for them to manage or live out their financial potential. You know, and, and, and then that actually, you know, means that people are paying more for financial products because imagine if you don't have a checking account and you do get a, you know, pay by a check, you, you have to, uh, you know, get that cash on a check, check, uh, uh, check cash in place and that way they may charge you three or four percent on the dollar. Uh, and so there was another study that actually found that just by looking at low income families, there are people that are making like $24,000 or less, okay? across the country that, that w when, you, when you look at how they spend that money, they found that uh, they're actually paying about 10% of that on fees for financial products, like again, cashing their checks and so forth, and interest. So they're spending 10% of their money to manage money, and it, it actually equals about, um, uh, about, uh, about how much money they're spending on, on, on groceries. I mean, so just imagine that. I mean, it's like you're only making twenty-four thousand dollars a year, and you know, ten percent of that it actually kind of goes off to pay the pay the lender or the you know check cashier or store and things like just because you don't have access you know to the products that we you know you and I take for granted. And of course, because of that, you know, uh, budgets get strained, you know, and uh, and 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 you know they can they cannot save, they can invest. You know, it, it kind of kind of gets even more difficult to pay, you know, for the day-to-day -day expenses, and you know, and rent alone, in in in, in large extent, is actually taking half of people's annual income. Uh, and, and there was a study that you know, was widely cited a couple of years ago, where they found that about 11 million Americans spend half of their annual income in rent alone. I know that might not be, you know, startling news for us here in the Bay Area in San Francisco, because you, know, you can be middle income, you can be a Googler, right? And, and, and still, you have to pay a significant amount on rent. I know that's the case for us here, but imagine that's the case for pe people and families living in, in Kansas, living in Florida, living in other places that may not 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 actually have have the benefit of having you know, a tech industry to rely on. And those people are really are hurting when half of their money is actually going to pay for rent. So, you know, so this is really, and I wanted to sort of take a time to kind of like paint the picture about that, you know, the nature of, 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 of folks you know, stuck in poverty is actually pretty dire. You know, and, uh, and, 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 and they really are grappling with things that are really beyond their control, really beyond you know, uh, you know, their, life, their lives. You know, but, but, but the reality is that, uh, when we build policies and programs, you know, we sort of like don't think about that anymore. We just sort of like, you know, uh, you know, look at people that are poor and sort of kind of blame them for poverty. You know, we sort of like say, hey, you know, some, something's wrong with you, you know, because you're, you're stuck in poverty or, or you're doing something wrong or, or it's really your fault. You didn't study hard enough. You didn't, you know, you didn't go to the right school or, or something was wrong with you and that's why, you know, you know we're going to leave poverty at, at that level. And this is something that, uh, that most people, you know, uh, folks call the deficit model, you know, where we, we actually use a deficit perspective to build, you know, uh, policies and, and services, you know, just to kind of address that. But, it, but the fact is, like, you know, it's kind of like, you know, blaming the victim, blaming them for their issues and, and not really recognizing, you know, the, the sort of like the broader economic forces at play that people are contending with. And so, so this is something that w what we want to sort of address head on and to basically say, is there a different way of looking at this issue rather than looking at it from a, from a deficit based, again, that sort of like holds people as, as deficient, as ignorant, as broken in some way, and then looking at people in a different way, you know, uh, so that, that way we can figure out how we can best align ourselves and best leverage what they have and, and work with people so that we can actually help them move their, you know, in, through their economic, uh, e economic journey. And this is exactly what we did at the Mission Asset Fund, where we, we came up with, with a, a, a new frame, what we call the um, more like a strength-based approach, you know, where we basically starts with the idea of, of, of respecting people. Imagine that. Isn't that a crazy idea? Respecting people, sort of acknowledging their dignity. Isn't that crazy? It's like starting a conversation with somebody and saying, I recognize your humanity because you're another 
person that we start a conversation based on that. But that's something that we, f we felt we needed to actually say verbally so that we, that way we can, you know, we can make that more of a thing, you know, because it definitely is not happening within our current, you know, political environment now. And also about meeting people where they're at, not where we think they should be or where we want them to be. But re reality is like kind of appreciating their, their, their uh, you know, their, their barriers, their, you know, their, um, you know, the pitfalls, the things that they're contending with, but really it's about meeting people where they're at. And also it's about leveraging what they have. It's about acknowledging that we all have something of worth. We all have something good to give and offer the people and offer the world. And so, so by, by finding those, the thing that is good in people's lives is fi then figuring out how can we leverage that so that, that way we can continue the conversation with them and really truly help them you know, move and improve their, their lives. So, so that, that is sort of like the frame that we sort of use to sort of talk about you know, the math approach, if you will, and, and about how we think about how we engage, uh, uh, you know, engage our clients. And so how we took this idea uh, and, and, and made it, uh, you know, and made it applicable to our work is by, by basically noting that you know, one of the things that, that, are, that, are, that is very common within the immigrant community you know, is this idea that people actually do come together uh, to help each other. Imagine that. It's not just an immigrant thing. It truly is like it's a human thing, right? It's like that's what we've, we've all been doing you know, for, for eons, right? But people actually still do it. Uh, uh, and so in, in a sense, in a, in a financial sense, this is something that we found that immigrants have this tradition of, of coming together and, and to lend and save money together. Uh, in Mexico, this is, a, this is an activity that's called uh, tandas, cundinas, all throughout the Caribbean, they call them susus. I mean, they have uh, you know, the, this tradition that happens all over the world and comes with a lot of different names. Now, but this is a very you know, informal practice. How many of you guys have heard about this? Um, lendings, well, I know you guys have, right? <laughs> Well, so, you know, so this activity of people lending each other is like, again, it's very common, but, but it's, it's informal, right? So it's informal that to the point where only the people in that circle are the ones that sort of know who they are, know who, you know, because it's, it's really based on this, the social trust that they have with each other, because mostly is, you know, each other's, you know, neighbors, you know, our coworkers, relatives, that they sort of going you know, to come together and help each other out. But, but so, so, so this is, again, again, the activity has been, is widely known, has, has been written out, you know, a lot. But because it's informal, you know, the, the formal financial systems, the credit bureaus, the banks, they had no idea about this. I mean, we knew, right? But, but the, the formal systems did not know. So what we did was, uh, um, it was, we figured out a way to actually make this into a formal practice. And this is the genesis of, of what we call lending circles where we found that people in the circle, uh, you know, let's say you can have a group of 10 people and each person, you know, puts in $100. So that group comes up with $1,000, right? And then everybody takes $1,000, you know, on a monthly basis. And they do that in rotation until everybody has a chance of getting $1,000. So what we've basically saw that is like, you know, this was pe people were making loans and they were paying, paying the loans back every time they put, put in $100. So we formalized the activity by having people sign a promissory note, basically saying, I, Jose, promise to pay $100 on a monthly basis for that $1,000 loan. And then through that formal, you know, uh, the, the promissory note, it gave us then math, the ability to then uh, service that loan for them, where we collect the money and we do the loan distributions. And then we also report that activity to the credit bureaus. And so right now we actually report to the three main credit bureaus, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion, so that that activity of reporting to credit bureaus, it actually is what helps people start the credit score or improve the credit score just by virtue of us reporting to them. So we basically took this activity, activity that was informal, but it was good, right? Because people, again, coming together to lend each other money, to save money together based on trust based on each other's relationship, which we thought it was a good thing, and people are still doing that you know, uh, in, in, in their communities. So we took that practice and formalized it in a way that we can give this, this sort of like, you know, this financial benefit of being able to start or improve their credit scores. Um, and, you know, so we're gonna give you, you know, an, an example of, of, of the type of folks that, that we work with, uh, because uh, again, this, is, this activity alone, uh, is helping people like, you know, like Michael here. And my, Michael, um, you, know, you know, he actually is, is from Ethiopia, and he was actually a doctor in Ethiopia, but he came to this country wanting to practice medicine, but he couldn't because he wasn't, you know, he, had, he didn't have the right credentials here. And like every other immigrant, 
you know, uh, you know that, that you come here, it's like, you know, the, you know, trying to learn what the credit system is here is, is always baffling, right? It's like, because, you know, people know that they need credit to get credit, but if you don't have credit, you can't get credit, right? So, so people get stuck in the sort of a catch-22. How many of you guys have been stuck in a catch-22? I know, right? I mean, it, it's real. It happens to people. And so, so then the question is, like, well, how do you break in? You know, how do you break into the system? They, 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 you know, they, you need to have credit in order to get credit. And so it's not, not only just, you know, the issue for, for immigrants of any type, right? But it's also, you know, it's a, it's a critical issue for, for young adults as well. Uh, so, you know, so he, you know, so Michael was one of, was an example of that, that, that he struggled to break into the credit system, but he actually, uh, you know, joined a lending circle. And then, so he basically went from a zero not having, being credit invisible to getting a credit score of 672, you know, by participating in the lending circle. And then with that credit score, with that credit history, he was able to sort of leverage that to continue on his studies and to continue on with, with his life, you know, uh, you know, here in the United States. You know, and Michael is an example of, of, you know, there's about 26, this is a report from the CFPB who found that there's about 26 million adults who are credit invisible, just like Michael. Uh, that again, there, are, there may be immigrant or maybe young adults, but people that are, that are completely invisible to the credit system. Um, but there's also other people uh, like, uh, like Alicia, you know, who, uh, who is, a, you know, a, a, is an entrepreneur by nature. She actually, you know, uh, makes the malas. You know, she, but, you know, she, so she wanted to, uh, uh, you know, to start her business, build her business, but she knew that she needed to have a good credit score in order to leverage, you know, uh, loans to make that happen. You know, but when she came to us, she actually had, you know, she had a pretty bad credit score. And, uh, and even, you know, the level of her business was so small that even the most, you know, good-hearted, you know, micro-lending, non-profit organization wouldn't even give her a loan. Not, now, when I'm talking about the Bank of America, so the Wells Fargo was like, these are the other non-profit organizations that were already set out to help people like her. So they wouldn't even lend her because of her financial situation. I mean, just to kind of give you an indication of where she was at at the time, you know, she would buy supplies to make her tamales on a weekly basis, and she was only... I think she was only making about like a, a hundred tamales per week when she started with us, uh, but she got her first loan with MAF, uh, and uh, and then she started building her credit. We had you know helped her you know manage her budgets and into the point where you know in the past uh, in the past year she actually grew her business where she now has even seven employees and making over three thousand tamales on a weekly basis. And she actually has dreams of increasing that you know th that number in the years to come. So, but it's people like her who, you know, had, you know, you know, could have had a bad credit score for a lot of different reasons, but, but this, through this program, we were able to kind of get her to a point where she was able to get loans from those, you know, uh, micro lending organizations and leverage those resources so that they, she can live out her entrepreneurial uh, dreams. And there's other people uh, like Alicia, Leticia as well, who, Leticia, also an immigrant, he came to this country as a young, uh, I don't know, she, actually she was 26 at the time. You know, she was married, she lived, you know, a legal permanent resident, uh, she had two children, you know, she had a house, you know, she had a business, you know, but then life happens. It happens to any, any one of us, right? Where in her case, you know, she, her, her marriage, you know, ended up in divorce and her kids, you know, grew up and moved out. And then she, uh, you know, she had a couple of foster kids to deal with, but she actually lost some of those investments because of just life happened to her. And so she was in, uh, and, and also, it also was compounded by the downturn in the economy at that time. But she was in a, in a situation where, uh, I remember when she kind of came to us, she said like, well, I, I'm gonna resign to the idea that I have to wait seven years in order be, before I kind of, you know, remake my financial lives. Because, you know, we all hear that, you know, you have to wait seven years before you can start improving your credit score, right? And so we say, you know what, you actually don't have to wait seven years. You can actually start now to actually improve you know, your, your, your credit history so that that way she can kind of continue on and, and rebuild her financial lives. So, so her credit score, when she started with us, it was at the very low 324. That's because, again, she had a lot of some foreclosures and it, it was really bad. But you know, through the years, she was able to increase that from 324 to uh, 626 you know, just by practicing that, and she was able to kind of get back and start in, in a new business as well. 
And so just to kind of give you an indication of like how, you know, by, by building on, on what is good in people's lives and actually acknowledging that and then building a program around it, building in, an infrastructure to make, make that actually work, we've been able to sort of help people like Michael, like Alicia and, and Leticia and thousands, thousands of others to actually kind of, you know, build and improve uh, and, and, you know, kind of realize their financial potential. Um, you know, in, in terms of the impact of our work, you know, we've managed over, you know, $6 million in lending circles. And I have to sort of say that these are all zero interest, zero fee loans, you know, because it's, again, this is the money that people are lending themselves. And we essentially are just like the, the servicers of those loans. Uh, you know, so over, you know, now it's about, six, you know, 6,400 loans. The repayment rates on all these loans, 99.3%. So like our default rate is like 0.7%. This is completely unheard of, even in the micro lending world, where the, end, in the, in the uh, average industry is more like 12 to 14% defaults. So this, to get like a 0.7% is really is, 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 is remarkable. Uh, on average, we see people's credit scores increase by 168 points, you know, and then with an average final score of 659. And that's, again, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a credit score where now they can actually start engaging, you know, uh, you know, um, you know lenders in the market, market price. And so we've, so we've seen significant impacts in people's lives, you know, over the past uh, seven years. And so how we did this work, of course, it was, you know, by investing, you know, in technology, you know, we build a whole apparatus, a lending circles, uh, uh, you know, platform to help us manage, you know, this very complicated financial transactions, uh, you know, because when we, we, when we started our work, you know, you know, uh, we couldn't go to Best Buy and just, you know, take off, you know, uh, you know pick up some, you know, uh, some, some software to, to manage lending circle loans. I mean, there's, there wasn't such a thing created, so we actually had to create it ourselves. So we built our platform on Salesforce, uh, and so, you know, that itself kind of gave us the ability to, to expand and increase our work beyond San Francisco. And, and, and we actually even have, uh, you know, we started with a mobile friendly, but now we're actually creating a lending circle app itself, a native app, so that that way we can help uh, our clients manage their money in that way. And uh, we've also, you know, again, you know, we do a lot of financial education. Uh, we provide, you know, a lot of tutorials, videos. We partner with a group called EverFi, and we use a lot of their videos. Uh, to to uh, to provide financial you know insights on how to navigate the financial the financial system. What we saw is that you know financial education alone by itself is really irrelevant. It doesn't really work. But when you actually tie it to a financial product where people actually learn something from the activity itself, we actually saw that people were able to improve their credit score by an additional 27 points than if people were just doing the financial product by itself. So that, that number itself kind of made me a believer that financial education, when it's properly presented to people in a way that is easy to use, manageable, uh, you know, it, it actually had a significant impact on their, on their lives. And we're also sort of expanding our work, you know, by way of uh, franchising the model with other nonprofit organizations. We're actually uh, engage, engaging other uh, organizations, other nonprofits, so, so that, that that way they can deliver lending circles to their own communities, and then we manage all of the, the technology, all of the operations on the back end. But so that, that way, you know, we just we can expand by having you know just one office in San Francisco. But through technology, you know, we're definitely expanding that. So right now, we have about 52 providers in 17 different states plus uh, the District of Columbia. And so uh, on the final slide, I want to again reiterate, you know, the, the the key takeaways from our work. And this is something that you know that I definitely wanted to uh, uh, come back to it, which is, you know, in, in addressing poverty alone, you know, it is a difficult issue and then we but we have to sort of you know think about it uh, in a different way so that that way we can actually you know provide significant impact to people's lives in the way that we've been thinking about it in the past I feel that that uh, you know is not up is not uh, working and people are actually getting stuck there even more and so and so and we also need to find solutions that are grounded in people's lives and not in what we, we you know on, on the assumptions that we have of their lives or whatever alternative facts we may have of of people in, in, in their struggles, but in, in, in their actual lived experiences. And then and, and, and through that, you know, where our hope is that America's you know, beacon will shine once again when we truly can remove all those barriers and pitfalls and actually allow people to realize their full human and financial potential. And so, so that, you know, if anything, if you can remember anything, please remember those, those two things that poverty is, is hard. 
It's not an easy thing. It's not something you can just wish away. But we actually do have to engage in, in people's lives and then really bring about you know, some significant uh, benefit to who they are. So I'll stop there and take any questions or um, just to, oh, yes, to make sure that uh, for all, the, all of you Googlers out in uh, YouTube land, yeah, I say that, uh, you know, definitely would love for you guys to engage with us, you know, through everyday, everyday heroes. Uh, you know, this is really is the time, you know, to be generous with your, with your resources, with your talent. You know, uh, based on what we've seen in the past two weeks, you know, we're going to be in, 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 in a fight, you know, for the next four years. And this is really where we need all hands on deck to actually make an impact and, and, and support and defend, you know, what we hold true, uh, not just for immigrants, but for really for, uh, for America as it is. So, so be generous with your time and resources. Engage with us, you know, join us, and, and then we'll figure out a way to, you know, to make common costs. And, and I'll leave you with my contact information. You can always email me or, or call or, or visit or, 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 us, or tweet us, and so that, that way we can find a way to, you know, to converse with you. So I'll end there, but if there's any questions or any um, comments. So how can you keep the default rate so low? Yes, that's a great question. You know, I, um, so people always ask us that, and I think it's because of this, is that we start our work by showing them respect. You know, we, we start the conversations by saying, like, we're here to help. These are zero interest, zero fee loans. This is their money, right? And then we also require for people to come together in a group and, and see each other face to face so that they know who is in that lending circle and they have a common relationship there. Now, they may not necessarily be each other's friends or best friends or neighbors. They may be total strangers, but because they're, we're sort of managing it as a nonprofit and we're you know, giving them the benefit of reporting it, you know, people follow through with their commitment. And so, and then we also tell them, it's like, you know what, if, you, you know, if there's a default, we take the hit. Math takes the hit, right? And so there's a commitment that we show them, and I think the commitment they, they show us in return, and they pay us back. I mean, that's one level of answering. Another thing is, too, is that, you know, our technology makes it really easy for them to participate. You know, we don't require them to, you know, you know send a check, or we don't say, you have to come here before 5 o'clock on Friday, or else we're going to close the door, and that's that. So we make it easy. So we're, in a sense, we're leveraging technology, just like in the way that you want to leverage technology to make your financial transactions easy. We're giving them the same power of technology to make their, li their financial lives easy, so they can actually then pay us, you know, in, 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 in a you know, an easy way. So, so if the, the lender and the borrower don't necessarily know each other before they come to you, what is the primary um, incentive for the people who front the money to participate? Yeah, you know, so we've asked that question to, uh, to folks because, uh, you know, you, if you get the lending circle uh, distribution at the, at the end, you're essentially putting in $100 on every month, and at the end you get the $1,000. So you're essentially kind of saving it. So some people do it because of that, because they want to save. They want that sort of social commitment you know, to save, or they want to make the social, uh, you know, or out, uh, you know, um, you know they, they, they want to make that, you know, be forced to do that. I mean, like a compulsory savings habit, if you will. So some, some people have that, 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 that benefit. You know, but other people, they know that by them putting in their money at play, that the others will get that money and then be able to sort of pay down high cost debt. So they're helping other people. And that's, that's something, again, that is actually important because when we think about poor people, we don't think about them as, you know, even having the potential for them to helping each other. But in this case, we actually see that where like some people you know, want the other person to be the first to take that $1,000 loan so that they can, you know, deal with their issues. And so, so I feel good, you know, they, they feel good, right? They feel good because they're helping their neighbor, they're helping other people, you know, manage their lives. So, 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 so their incentive is not necessarily just uh, monetary because, you know, they get no benefit, you know, they, they, we're not giving them, a, you know, a, a dividend, we're not giving them an interest payment, you know, they're going to get $1,000 at the end, right? Uh, but, but I think it's like they, they, they like the social component of it, you know, just as well. Are they people from the same social circles as the borrowers? Yes. Yeah, so imagine that 10 people in the lending circle are both the lenders and the borrowers. So imagine if you're the first person to get the $1,000, you're the borrower, and the nine people are lenders. And then if you're the second person, you then transform yourself from a, from a lender to a borrower, 
And then the other A people are lenders, you know? I mean, you know, they're lenders, right? And so when you get the lump sum distribution, you transform yourself into, the, into, that, into that lender. And so, so they're both lenders and, and borrowers at the same time. And so, so it's kind of hard to imagine because, you know, traditionally we think about, you know, ex the external resource that comes in, you know, a bank gives us money and then we pay them back. And that's the only relationship they have. But here is that we manage it to, to do it in, in, in the traditional way. Like this is actually, you know, this is how they do it. And, you know, by, by, by us formalizing it, we were able to kind of give people the benefit of reporting it to the credit bureaus. Could you speak a little bit more about your expansion across the country in collaboration with other nonprofits? I'm just curious how you're working with them and what their role is in the. Yeah, in the well, program. thank you for that. So, yeah, I, you know, so one of the things that uh, uh, in the nonprofit sector we do a lot is we, t we talk a lot about cooperation. You know, we talk about doing things together because that's just our nonprofit speak. You guys have your own Google speak, we have our own nonprofit speak. Uh, but in reality, it's actually very hard to work with other nonprofits in coalition. You know, particularly, you know, when, when you talk about, you know, products and services, because, you know, uh, as a nonprofit, you know, that product is our, is our, you know, intellectual property, right? So when you actually kind of give it away, it, it sort of diminishes, you know, people's ability to actually fundraise or support that. So, it's our, so, so we talk a lot about it, but it actually never happens in a great deal. So, what, what, so how we found a way to do that, however, we found a way to, uh, to essentially kind of franchise the product we would franchise a program where we engage uh, nonprofit organizations that want to implement the program, and then we, you know, we have a contract with them to say, well, here's, we're going to give you the program you know, as a franchise, and then we're going to give you the TA, the training and technical assistance to, for them to implement it but, it, but it's still our product, so that, that way we can you know, keep quality control over it, right? And so, so that that way we can engage with them. And then they, in turn, pay us a fee. They pay us a license fee for managing that. But then what they get in return is that they have the, now this is a phenomenal innovative product that where they can actually fundraise around it so that they can support their staff time and their, you know, their operation, which is exactly what needs to happen. And so, so, so in a sense, by us uh, giving it away and, and as, as a franchise you know, product, you know, we were able to sort of replicate it without us going to those cities and starting nonprofit, I mean, and mission as a fund, or, you know, uh, office, right? Because for us, that's actually, it's a cost prohibitive path because, because there's no resources that we can tap to open 50 offices across the country, much less even 10 or two. I mean, it's just hard for nonprofits because we don't have access, access to, you know, venture capital or other sort of resources that could, that could, that could help us with that. So here we basically took a page from our clients, actually, which is partner work with each other, trust each other, have, have, you know, have, you know, have, a, you know, have a relationship with each other that is, that, that is mutual in effect, right? And so, and so in that sense, it's, it's working well. Now, you know, in, in the, the work, however, is about you have to continually train. There's a lot of, you know, the technology that we have had to build to make sure that they're actually using that, you know, the technology properly. And we have to retrain and retrain constantly so that the, that the staff, you know, can uh, implement the program correctly. But, but, but that really was the only way for us to, you know, scale the way that we have scaled. You know, I sort of say that, you know, and I started at the beginning by saying like nonprofits, we talk a lot about cooperation, but it doesn't happen a lot. It's because it's just hard to do. And so, and so, and so there's not a lot of examples of, you know, in the nonprofit field of, of others that, that have franchised the programs in the way that we have. And, and so, and I think that's just one of the sad realities of our field. Thank you. Good questions. Um, I have a question now yeah. that I don't know the answer to. Does the Mission Asset Fund accept direct donations? No, we do not accept. <laughs> yes, we do accept direct donations. So if you, uh, you know, if uh, again, give generously. I know you have a lot of uh, talents. You know, a lot of your expertise can also be a, a great benefit to us. You know, we have a lot of ideas. You know, but we really are, are, are poor in, in, in time and resources and talent. So if you guys want to sort of help with that re regard, we know we can, again, tinker and innovate on, on you know, uh, to, to make something real happen. So, so again, thank you so much for the opportunity to come, come to the Google campus and share our story. I think there's something that is real there, and we definitely are trying to uh, share with, with the world. And in, 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 in times like this, we have to sort of tell our stories you know, as, a, as an immigrant, about what we're doing, you know, on the edges, you know, because this is really what, what makes America great, and we want to sort of protect that, and we will need to defend that and not, and not allow somebody else to, 
tell us otherwise, because I do not believe that you know, the current president is going to write the last chapter in America. He does not have that authority, nor the right. Uh, we will, but we have to continue, continue working together to make that happen. So again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.